The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, there's a little bit of a lull right now in the Africa debt relief issue. What we had from, say, March, April was a flurry of activity coming out of the G20, the World Bank, the IMF, the Chinese. And since then, it seems like a lot of things are in motion, but it's all happening behind the scenes. Now, one of the things that's happened also during this time of the past four or five months is there's been a lot of confusion about the role of Chinese financing in Africa. And it really, I'd say, goes back to somewhere around May or June. And uh, Xi Jinping at the time, he issued a statement or in a speech, he said that he was going to delay loan repayments for 77 low-income countries, particularly those in Africa. He also said he was going to forgive interest-free debt. Now, a lot of Chinese press And a lot of uh, Chinese stakeholders took that and said, we're doing debt forgiveness. Yay! Well, it's not quite that simple because interest-free loans represent a small portion of China's overall lending. But it doesn't take into account the concessional loans, the market loans, loans from SOEs, state-owned enterprises, from commercial banks. There are so many different actors here that when we say Chinese financing or Chinese debt, it really is an inaccurate term and misleading in many ways. Yes. Um, take, for example, you know, China is obviously is a G20 member and the G20 announced the debt um, service suspension initi- initiative, which is uh, an initiative to freeze repayments for about six months. So there's talk about maybe extending it. And this is is a great example of this kind of confusion because certain Chinese um, entities like the Exxon Bank, for example, they they are part of this initiative. Other Chinese entities like the China Development Bank are not. Um, And there's all kinds of complicated kind of divisions between what constitutes bilateral lending and what doesn't, what is commercial lending or what isn't, and so on. So it's, it's a very complicated field. And it's interesting that distinction between the China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank, that's a dispute that's now starting to take shape in Washington because a World Bank president, David Malpass, has been calling out the China Development Bank for not doing more on the DSSI type of, uh, of loans. And yet, uh, Deborah Braudigam and the folks at the China Africa Research Initiative are highlighting, as you pointed out, that China Development Bank's loan lending in Africa X Angola is actually quite small. So they're not really sure as to what's going on. And it really, again, goes to this point of confusion about Chinese financing, development, and commercials. So we thought it would be a good exercise today to try and step back and speak with somebody who actually is involved in this and try to get a clearer picture so that once this starts to ramp up again, so we're in this lull right now, as I mentioned, but once this starts to ramp up again, uh, we'll all have the proper vocabulary on how to do that. And so for that, we are thrilled to have with us for the show for the first time from Beijing, Kanyi Lue. Uh, Kanyi is a senior project finance lawyer based in Beijing. Uh, he's got extensive experience working with both Chinese lenders and borrowers uh, dating back all the way to 2003. Uh, and he has a real breadth of experience from working all over the world in Australia, Hong Kong, London, Taiwan, and Beijing. And at one point, he was even seconded to the International Finance Corporation, which is the World Bank's private sector sister organization. Uh, Kanye, a very good evening to you in Beijing, and thank you for joining us. Hi, Eric. Hi, Kobus. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. And I, I just very quickly before we get started, given that we are in some weird space here. I just want to put a little bit of disclaimer, and the fact that you're a lawyer makes it all that more important that uh, Kanye, uh, since he's a lawyer, he I think it's a good idea that we should acknowledge the fact that he's joining us today strictly in his personal capacity, and none of the views that he's sharing with us today or any part of the discussion represents those of his firm or his clients or anyone else for that matter. Is that right? I got the, the legal stuff out of the way? Perfect. Thank you very much okay. for that. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, let's start with the basics, Kanye, because you're a guy who's actually been on the front lines. You've worked with these loans. You've worked with the lenders and the borrowers in the, in the development finance space and all the aspects of the financing. 
You also wrote two blog posts, which I'm going to link to in our show notes, Chinese financing, how will China restructure zero interest loans? And then also another article, which was just a great primer, Chinese finance, banking with Chinese lenders. So let's start with the basics. Can you break down Chinese lending? Because in your article, you said it really kind of falls into three distinct categories. Let's start with there in those three distinct categories of Chinese lending. Sure, no problem. So uh, before we start, uh, let me just very quickly recap on the history. And as you are no doubt aware, Eric, that um, lending sort of evolves with the times. And um, I think Chinese lending started back in the 60s, the 1960s, that is, uh, but really took off in the 1999 and onwards after the announcement of China's going out policy. Uh, and, and I think for those who might recall, that was really the period when China had a lot of accumulating, very quickly accumulating foreign reserves that were building up. And as a way to redeploy those reserves, U.S. dollar reserves were being deployed overseas. And that, that was what prompted the very quick growth. Uh, in 2013, uh, obviously, the, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, was announced, which continued and put a name to the already considerable size of the project. Uh, so between 2000 and 2018, uh, I think Chinese lenders have been reported to have committed about $148 billion of loans, uh, about 5% of which were zero interest. So that, that comes out to, to around 7 ish billion. Uh, by today's exchange rate, 7.4. And those are the loans, just to be clear, those are the loans that President Xi forgave in his speech this June, correct? Uh, well, that was the announcement. So we'll, we'll come to that in, in a minute. Uh, but that, that's right. So uh, the announcement was that debt relief was going to be granted. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it debt cancellation. There's a slight nuance. I think that has to do with the translation in some of the reports that we've seen. I frequently see the characterization, particularly from, from um, Western sources, that China is particularly focused on debt as an as a instrument for development, so like loan-based development, um, why, whereas other, other Western countries frequently characterize themselves as giving grants, i.e. Not, not kind of adding to the debt burden of, of countries. Is this a fair division? Well, okay, so, so I, think, I think that has to do with how we look at loans. Right. So as Eric mentioned, if you look at all of the loans coming out of China, they can be broadly divided into three types. So the first type are your zero interest loans coming from the Ministry of uh, Commerce out of China. So these, in my personal view, I actually view these as sort of quasi loan slash grants. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because these loans are generally granted to countries in need and they have a history of being forgiven. So uh, in, in the early 2000s, uh, in 2018 and in 2020, uh, you know, a number of rounds of debt relief were announced, and most of these loans uh, ended up being forgiven, you know, from you know, uh, historical loans, that is. So, so if you look at the history, then you, know, you can actually think of these loans as being grants. And then uh, the second and third types of loans that you see coming out of China are uh, the concession loans. And then obviously the final type are what we call the commercial loans. Um, the actual species of loans that, that, uh, that are available are actually a bit more nuanced than that. But generally speaking, you can categorize the lendings into these three types. And what is the breakdown, in, from, if you know this, uh, between the concessional and the commercial loans? Do you have any sense of how much, what percentage there are of those two categories, given that we know that the grants and interest-free loans are rather small? Yeah. So the grants, uh, they're on average about 10 million, so not terribly large. Uh, we know that, I think uh, you mentioned Professor Deborah Brodigan, she reported uh, they comprise of about 5%. So I think I, uh, I agree with that. So based on what we do here, uh, by working with the, the, the clients and the institutions here, I think these zero interest loans comprise of a very small percentage of the loans coming out of China historically. Um, 
On the concession loans, uh, I think um, as I can, as far as I can tell, they they currently comprise of about one third of the loans currently else committed. Uh, so you know, sizable, uh, but by no means the large the lion's share. So in fact, if you look at all the loans committed, I would say most of it are actually commercial in nature. You know, when we talk about commercial loans, are they roughly the same as as market based loans from from um, from private sector investors, uh, which is one one of the the categories of of lending that Africa is particularly struggling with at the moment, or is is are they kind of are they categorized as commercial loans in a different way? Well, okay. So commercial loans are, generally speaking, obviously there's a range uh, of terms, and because it's it's uh, it's market driven, uh, and that's why you know you'll see different terms coming out and you know, falling under this type of loans. Generally speaking, um, it's typically you know if we're talking about USD loans. Uh, US dollar loans uh, generally it's pegged to six month LIBOR. There are obvious variations. Uh, the interest rate is usually LIBOR plus anywhere between two fifty to four hundred. I've heard stories where it goes down to as low as probably you know half a percent above LIBOR. In some of the cases, I think that would, that involved Ghana, probably even less than half a percent. Um, and then it could be much higher than 4% in some other cases. So it, this, all this very much depends, as you expect, for a commercial loan, quote-unquote. Uh, it depends on the, uh, the, the credit of the borrower, the credit support provided, and you know, the jurisdiction, the risk involved. And what is LIBOR? I think it's an important concept because in terms of understanding how Chinese loans are priced, say, compared to other market-based loans. What is LIBOR? Sure. So LIBOR, uh, and it's, it's one of the uh, hotter topics right now because it's actually on the way of being phased out. So historically, LIBOR, as you say, is the lender interbank offer rate. So it's, the, it's a commercial rate that, came, uh, that, 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 were, that was offered between banks to each other for lendings between banks. And typically speaking, historically, it's being treated as uh, how you would call the... Um, uh, the, the cost of getting the funds in place. So if you think of you know, banks as in the business of selling, you know, sort of lending loans, this is the cost of them getting the money that they lend out from somewhere else. So it's their cost. And when I say LIBOR plus, you know, say you know, anywhere between 250 basis points to 400, a basis point is a hundredth of a percentage point. So what I'm really saying is that a lot of times what you see for the Chinese commercial lending is six-month LIBOR, that is the, the cost, plus anywhere between 2.5% to 4%. Um, and how is that different from, from kind of Western market-based loans, uh, you know, which is increasingly also making up a big part of African lending? So it depends on which bank you're talking about and also who you're referring to. I think um, for the minute, I think it will, there's no way we can be precise when we're talking about the the large number of commercial lenders. Uh, but if you look at the World Bank, they do have market-based loans, and which are generally based at six-month LIBOR as well. Uh, but I think um, based on some of the research I found, it's around about 2%, 200, 200-ish basis points. So it's, uh, it's, I think Chinese loans, when you compare them to World Bank's offerings, they're sort of comparable, although the World Bank tends to be on the lower side. But we should also bear in mind that the World Bank and all of its institutions falling under the group are lenders of last resort. That is, you know, you can only borrow from them if you do not have, if you do not otherwise have access to other financing sources. And so in that sense, that's why the Chinese lending is so important, is in part because African countries and other developing countries may not have access to capital from other sources. So the Chinese come in with a, a rate that is more or less, as you said, at the LIBOR rate or at the international standard rate. And then the World Bank would say, well, as long as you can get capital from somewhere else, we're not going to necessarily lend to you. So these countries then turn to China as a primary lender. Is that a, a fair assessment of it? 
Uh, yeah, I think I think that's one way of looking at it. Uh, of course, world. Ba- I mean, I don't look at this as sort of a competition, as you know. Um, but but you know, I think yes, uh, to the extent that um, uh, borrowers come to the Chinese lenders, they tend to come with a project, and and when you consider uh, the proposition that Chinese corporates and banks bring to the table, that is, they are able to bring construction expertise as well as financing, that becomes a very attractive proposition. One of the, the big criticisms against Chinese lending um, is that the, the, the terms of the loans and also the negotiations around them are, are characterized as very opaque. So this has been this kind of you know, kind of like shorthand assumption, I think, by, by, by everyone in the field. So, But I just wanted to check with you, do you agree that Chinese lending practices are particularly opaque? Um, and in, in which ways are they less transparent? Or in which ways do, does thinking about transparency differ between them and, and other major lenders? Well, I think it depends on how you look at transparency. So um, I think, uh, so there are a number of uh, perspectives. So one, uh, when you're looking from the working level, that is, if you're working on one of these tra- financing deals, uh, the, the one reason why people might find the, um, the practices to be uh, opaque is perhaps because of how decisions are made. And, you know, if you go to any large bank, you'll find that there are multiple levels of approvals that you have to get. So usually you have to get the, the relationship bankers buy in. They will put together a transaction on the terms with a term sheet. And then they go to their credit committee and to a number of departments for approval. And, you know, Chinese banks are not different. You know, it's just that, you know, the, the, there might be different layers of approvals, which are not, might not be uh, familiar or as transparent to the outside. But I, I don't think any bank, you know, sort of discloses its internal workings in full to anybody, you know, regardless of where you're from. So I think, I think that's one reason why that might be, uh, that, 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 might, that might be. Uh, the second is, you know, as a whole, if you look at Chinese lendings, I would actually argue it's not that uh, non-transparent. So it's actually, you know, a lot of the information out there and that, you know, so if you look at research by, you know, Deborah Brodigan from Johns Hopkins or Scott Morris from CGD, um, you know, they actually have a lot of good information there. And, you know, um, and, and I think part of the issue with um, the, 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 the criticism of non-transparency is that a lot of the information are actually not in English. So if you read Chinese, it's all out there for you to see. But, you know, not everybody reads Chinese. So I, I suspect that might be another part of the reason. It's interesting because, Kobus, there was a discussion on Twitter over this issue uh, with a number of some of the different uh, Africa analysts in Washington, D.C. And, and some people brought up the very interesting point that says that on this question of transparency, where does the United States or the European Union or the French post their loan contracts or lending or financial. And there were these sites that had a lot of information, but they didn't include the terms and the interest rates. And that was a very important omission in some of these development sites. And I was wondering, Kobus, if you have ever come across the question of transparency of whether or not U.S., European, Japanese loans are published, say, in English on a website with terms and interest rates and the details that are often used to criticize the Chinese. Have you ever seen something like that, Kobus? I have not seen them in you know, kind of much much of that in in that much detail. But I have to admit, I'm I'm also you know I, I tend to look at at loans kind of from a political perspective more than a hard economics perspective. So you know I'm I'm frequently okay. not the one who's like diving into into the interest rates and so on. The, those are some of my colleagues. But yeah, I agree with okay. you that it's actually I think on the Western side also not as transparent as many people would assume. Yeah, uh, Kanye, have you ever? seen uh in, because you've worked in other countries as well whether or not the the international financial institutions or uh w- you know u.s european japanese banks publish the level of transparency that they are expecting from the chinese i mean I, i'm just curious because i haven't actually seen the loans coming out of the west that have this published saying here's the term here's the rate whatnot and that's oftentimes one of the big criticisms of the chinese have you ever seen a database like that you know, funny you say that. So um, not really, not, not something like that per se. Obviously, for the commercial loans um, in, in the market, we have publications which uh, are partially based on information released by the banks themselves. Uh, 
uh, or gossip. Uh, so you actually have publications that come out uh, and does that. So it, it's an information service that you pay for. Uh, but I should also just mention that you know bankers are under typically under a duty of confidentiality anyway. So unless they're allowed to disclose that, you know, to to actually tell publicly disclose the details of their financing would likely cause them to breach their duty of confidentiality. So it's a, it's a breach of contract. Yeah, but in public so, finances, you would think that that would be yeah. different. I mean, this is yeah. African public finance, African taxpayer money being used to fund these projects and take out these loans. One would think that those confidentiality clauses are looser so that taxpayers and legislatures would have an opportunity to review some of those loans, or at least yeah, the contracts. And, be, and you will be right. But the obligation for that disclosure typically lies on the borrower. Right. So if you're a government trying to borrow money from overseas, uh, typically, for, and for a lot of countries, this is the case, uh, there is a requirement for you to table the loan agreement or at least the key terms with Congress or Parliament, uh, or at least the ministers will have to present it to, to, uh, to the cabinet. Uh, there will be some type of gazetting that is public disclosure requirement before the loan agreement can actually come into force. So actually, that's one way where we find out a lot of this information. You know, the bankers tend not to volunteer very much because they can't. But the borrowers, uh, if they're sovereigns, if they're government, uh, typically they have to. So that's, that's how the information gets out. Do you have an, an impression about how much concern there is in in uh, Chinese in the, these kind of official finance circles at the moment in China in, about the situation in Africa, and you know b- because on the African side there's there's a lot of concern, but it also is in a kind of a vacuum of information. We're not 100 percent sure like what's going on behind the scenes in terms of arranging any kind of debt relief, anything from you know the the the, the details of China's involvement in the G20 um, in, initiative to all of the other Chinese actors involved, um, you know, like how fired up do you think the the that community is in China about this issue at the moment? Well, I think it's definitely uh, on the minds of most bankers that I work with, um, and you know, it's you know, as as a banker, that the main focus that that you have are making sure that you get repaid. You know, if I could put it that way, and I think that's the same regardless of whether you're Chinese or American or European. So, uh, so that's certainly one thing. Um, you know, just just going back to the type of loans, I think for the Mofcom zero interest loans, I think people sort of know what's going to happen because uh, with these uh, these zero interest loans, they tend to be forgiven, right? But the way they do it is not through an announcement or just a blanket forgiveness. Typically, the government will announce a program for debt relief, but then it's up to the borrower to talk to. You the Ministry of Commerce and ask for debt relief. And historically, um, you know, they, they would uh, either forgive or they would defer payments due in any for any given year. And then, you know, as, as the things go on, you know, people will then work together and work out what will happen in the future. So I think that's pretty straightforward. And uh, while I don't have a crystal ball, I expect that to happen as well. Uh, in this case, I think the bigger issue is that, you know, given the co- concession loans and commercial loans from, forms about 95% of all the loans, what's going to happen with them? And if you look at, uh, you know, this year is unlike any other year, as you know, so, um, you know, I can't, I can't really say what might happen. But historically, uh, if anything I found is that I found the Chinese bankers to be quite willing to work flex- flexibly. Uh, and, and typically these loans, if, if uh, become stressed, then what will happen is that they will either be restructured or refinanced. But they won't be forgiven. They won't be wiped out or canceled. And this is one of the talking points that's been going on because there's a, a tradition in the United States and Europe, especially in dealing with, with Africa over the past, say, 30, 40 years, that when there's a debt crisis, there is a period of cancellation. But the Chinese are showing that they approach debt in a very different way. And But forgiveness and cancellation is not part of the discussion. Why is that? And what are some of the cultural traits behind that? The first uh, cultural assumption is that, I think for most people, is that if you borrow, you should repay. And so I think that's the general assumption. Uh, but the second, I think, is a, um, a belief in that it's better to help them uh, or help borrowers to establish a way of repayment as opposed to cancellations of existing loans. 
the third, uh, which is a much more uh, issue, uh, a set of issues that are much more relevant to people here in China, is that um, these loans, if they're made by banks, they are subject to prudential standards and regulatory requirements, and if they forgive them, uh, they will hit their bottom lines immediately. Right, so I think I think that would be quite a difficult issue for the banks to deal with, given the size of these loans. And secondly, um, for a lot of the or for the bankers working for state-owned banks, uh, having a defaulted loan on your record actually, um, you know, can have can have repercussions when it comes to promotions going forward. There we go, Kobus. That is a very important point that we have not heard from in the previous discussions. That there, that there are people's careers are at stake here on this stuff. It gets very personal. Yes. Very interesting, Kai. Yeah. So, uh, but and as you can see, that's quite different from a lot of the, the international banks and how they operate. So, uh, the bankers in China, obviously, you know, people do change jobs, but as you know, uh, China has a state-led economy, and. Um, and as part of that, a lot of the banks are, you know, not all of them, but most of the banks are government owned. And as a result, even if you were to change jobs, you know, I think there's a record that stays with you. And, the, um, and it is important that you know, you're able to show that you've done your job well, consistently, when you go up for promotions and going forward. So I think that's part of the discussion that I think people haven't really touched on, which is uh, the bankers uh, are themselves motivated to, one, make sure the loan performs well, and two, work with borrowers when they're distressed, so to make sure that things are, you know, are, are handled in a way that, that works out for the borrower, but also the bank and themselves. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. In in the early parts of this crisis, um, there was a there were many calls from Africa for a, a blanket kind of one stop, um, de- the temporary debt servicing suspension. Um, you know, in order because because time was of the essence, and there was the the danger of African countries having to deal with both a, a, a health crisis and um, an economic crisis. You know, while trying to balance all of the the normal payments of the servicing payments of the of their debts. Um, so. You know, that that call particularly came from the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. They they were spearheading a call for a kind of a blanket one stop, you know, for all of the African countries kind of you know kind of time saving initiative. Um, China said that they would prefer to go on a case by case basis. Why do you think that was? Why why was it kind of a, a stepping away from a blanket solution? Well, uh, I think that's a question that's slightly above my pay grade. But if I have to guess, I guess the the size um, of the loans are probably quite different. And you have to understand, China does not function as a monolithic, you know, entity. So a lot of these loans are underwritten, you know, in some cases by the government. In the case of the zero interest loans, uh, in the case of the concession loans, they come from China Exim. Uh, for the commercial loans and pref- whether you call it preferential buyer's credit or commercial buyer's credit or other types of loans, these are coming from the usual commercial banks, including China Development Bank. Right? So, so it's not just simply a, a matter of the government saying, yes, we will you know, forgive these loans and then it, it gets done. There are processes and, and things to go through internally. <coughs> Excuse me. I suspect that that is why uh, debt relief discussions are always done on a case-by-case basis. I guess what's confusing to a lot of outsiders who don't understand this system, which is much more complex than it appears, is that there is a political role in all of this. So you talked about Exim Bank and that the bank, the, that the government either controls or owns or is somehow involved in vast parts of the banking system. So if the government wants to do this, this is the assumption that a lot of us on the outside would make. The government can can make it happen. It can do anything it wants because everything presumably is in some way or another under its control. 
even a bank like ICBC, which is the largest bank in the world, they have a lot of loans, in, in uh, commercial loans, for example, in Africa. And so if it was a political priority, at some point, they could say, okay, magic wand out, we're going to do this, this, and this, and everybody will fall in line. What you're saying, though, is it's not that simple. Uh, that's right. So obviously, I'm not privy to the inner workings of government, uh, being just a lawyer and all. Uh, but look, based on, you know, the, the, the time I've spent working with the state-owned enterprises and the banks here, I think, yes, in theory, the government owns uh, the shares of uh, many of, you know, all of the state-owned enterprises and the public banks. Um, but as a shareholder, they actually don't step in. You know, I think, I think there's a misconception that, you know, bankers get a call from, you know, from Zhong Nanghai and then say, yes, you, you lend to this guy and, and it happens. That's not how it happens. You know, I think, I think one uh, repeated description of uh, how things are done in China at a political level is that it's very much a governance uh, by consensus. And I do think that happens with the banks as well. So, uh, you know, the banks have their own internal processes to go through. Uh, as part of that, they may ask for comments from the different departments. So in terms of sovereign lending, so I understand sometimes they ask for input from, say, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or so on. Uh, but that, that is actually one part of the input. It's not the final decision. Um, you know, each of the, as you know, China is a big place. You know, if somebody, you know, in Beijing is in charge of all the loans, you know, he will never get any sleep, right? So, so that, that's just not how this happened, how, how this works. When you look forward to, to, to the rest of the year, um, what kind of developments would you predict on African loans coming from China? Let's see. So, so I think if you look over the last three years from 2017, you can see that uh, investments have coming have uh, into the mature economies such as the U.S., Canada, Australia, Europe have dropped off significantly. So, I think at the end of beginning of this year, I think um, we've seen uh, a case. I think uh, calculations. Uh, of something around dropping off by about 70%, over 70%. Uh, but at the same time, EPC activities as well as investments into Africa have grown. And actually, over half of the growth in EPC contracts coming out of China are with the Belt and Road countries. So I think that suggests to me that as things um, become more difficult, with the U.S., capital has to be deployed. Yes, things are slowing down because of the, the pandemic and also general frictions. But, you know, uh, I think um, quite a bit of the capital is being redeployed to Southeast Asia, to Africa, and then to Latin America and other places. And I think, I think that will continue. Uh, albeit at a slower pace. Uh, you mentioned EPC. What is EPC? Ah, yes. It's uh, engineering, procurement, and construction contracts. So, so that's infrastructure. That's right. So, I mean, okay. it, 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 it's, a, it's a number of things. So it could be anywhere from sort of your highways to ports to power plants to renewable energy. So it's, it's, it's an it, it's a acronym referring to all of these things. Construction. I hear what you're saying about how because in the global north, Canada, Australia, the US, Europe, it's getting more difficult for the Chinese for all sorts of political reasons to, to, to park their money there. So they're going to look other places to, to put their money, and that might be the Persian Gulf, Africa, the global south, and Belt and Road countries, if you will. I hear that, and I've read that quite a bit. The data, though, is starting to show that in Latin America and Africa, there's been a significant drop-off of investment. There are a lot of projects going on, but at a much smaller scale. And I'm going back to what you said about how all the different factors, including the fact that people's careers are on the line in terms of lending. And given the fact that uh, Africa right now is going through a debt crisis where it looks like a lot of the, the loans will either not be paid back or will take decades to pay back, um, the days of the Chinese lending $6 billion to build a railroad in Kenya or many billions to build railroads in Nigeria may be coming to an end and that they will be far more judicious as to what they finance and at a much smaller scale. What are you hearing in terms of the mood and the appetite for these large, as you said, EPC or infrastructure contracts that the Chinese were famous for in building in places like South America and Africa? 
Well, I think it's、uh, it's natural for people to be cautious. And one consistent message that I hear from people here in Beijing is that you know business is is difficult because of the inability to travel. So even though things are still going on and people are still going overseas. It's becoming very difficult, and for a lot of these major projects, you need to go and do your due diligence. You need to see the people,、uh, you need to see the site, and not being able to do that has certainly slowed down the pipeline.、Uh, but that being said, if you,、um, I think I I, I read、uh, from the Ministry of Commerce the other day. I think.、Um, EPC, the value of EPCs have actually increased.、Um, let me just.、Uh, Yes. So, according to the Ministry of Finance,、uh, Commerce. Sorry about that.、Uh, as I mentioned earlier, much of the investment are going to、um, you know Southeast Asia,、uh, Africa.、Um, but the value of EPCs,、uh, which are over a hundred million, have actually increased、uh, by around seven percent in the first quarter of this year. So that's actually quite interesting because a hundred million is not huge by Chinese standards. But that actually indicates、uh, a growth in the value of the overall EPC contracts, and you know, to, even though we love to talk about the billion-dollar EPC projects、uh, that we see on the news,、uh, the fact of the matter is they don't happen every day. You know, it's actually the smaller EPCs that keep things going. I think that will continue. You know, one of the one of the complications of of this whole situation is the the wide number of of Chinese actors involved in in African lending.、Um, and you know, as you mentioned, that's just one of the reasons for taking、um, debt relief on a case by case basis.、Um, so you mentioned some of them. You mentioned Mofcom. You mentioned the Exim Bank, the China Development Bank. Who are some of the other major players that that we might not You know, kind of know so well who are also you know kind of calling the shots in terms of Chinese lending to Africa.、Um, so okay, so you have Mofcom, obviously.、Uh, you have the three policy banks, out of which、uh, in China,、uh, out of which two you're aware of. So one is China Exim, the other one is China Development Bank.、Uh, there is also the Agricultural Development Bank of China,、uh, I think, which is less、uh, visible in terms of infrastructure.、Uh, then. And then you have the commercial banks.、Uh, out of the commercial banks, obviously you have the big four. So these are your Bank of China's, the ICBCs, the China Construction Bank, and the Agricultural Bank of China. So which is not to be confused with the policy bank with a similar name. And then you have the general,、uh, the the non big four commercial banks, which are slightly smaller in scale, but they're also quite quite large. These include the likes of Citic, the Bank of Communications. Uh, you know, China Merchants Bank and so on. So all of these banks are actually active, although、uh, for obvious reasons, the big four banks、uh, have a much larger share of the market, mainly because they went out earlier than the other banks. If you put the banks aside, then there's a there's a very important entity that that we we have to talk about, which is Sinoshore. It is effectively China's export credit agency. Uh, what it does, it performs a function that is kind of similar to U.S. Exim,、uh, but with a slightly different remit. So what I mean by that is this U.S. Exim,、uh, now that it's being revitalized, it, it can actually provide direct loans in addition to guarantees and issuing、uh, insurance covers for loans made by other banks. Sinoshore doesn't make its own loans, so as you can see from its name, it's an insurance company. So they provide insurance policies covering both political and commercial insurance for loans as well as investments made by Chinese companies, but also、uh, to foreign players, which can demonstrate some type of Chinese element in their dealings. But no deal gets done without Sinoshore. Is that correct?、Uh, not quite true. So there are.、Uh, so uh, I would say.、Uh, A very large percentage of deals involve Sinoshore, but there are also a lot of、uh, non-Sinoshore deals. So I think a couple years back, ICBC and、uh, one of the other Chinese banks they made loans to involve India without Sinoshore's involvement. So there are、uh, large and small loans which、uh, do not require Sinoshore involvement. Do, do you see Chinese?、Um 
thinking about lending to Africa undergoing a, a, a major change due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, do you, you know, kind of, is it is it a situation of just like kind of getting things r- kind of back to roughly where they were 2019 levels, albeit somewhat smaller, you know, kind of somewhat more conservative? Or is it going to force a, a, a significant rethink of, of Chinese approaches to African lending? Uh, I do think people are becoming more cautious. And obviously, because of COVID, um, you know, there are a lot of loans which are up for discussions, you know, everywhere. So, you know, generally speaking, uh, you know, uh, borrowers under stress, the economy is, you know, it's, 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 it's challenged. So I, I think people are going to be uh, generally cautious. But I, I do think that Given the infrastructure gap we have, both in Africa and elsewhere, uh, you, you are going to continue to see uh, financings as well as, you know, uh, just general financings as well as EPC financings, uh, you know, globally. Uh, probably uh, not so much uh, in the developed economies you know, because of political issues, um, but I, th- I do think that you will continue to see the Chinese. Uh, in Southeast Asia, you know, in Central Asia, you know, in, in Africa and Latin America. Kai Yiloy is a senior project finance lawyer based in Beijing. He does a lot of work with banks, with clients, public, private, to facilitate a lot of these deals. He's got two excellent blog posts, Chinese Financing, How Will Chinese Restructure Zero Interest Loans, and Chinese Finance Banking with Chinese Lenders. We'll put links to those on our site. Uh, Kanye, thank you so much for taking the time to explain this all out. It was, again, I hope this was going to be a primer for us, uh, a China Africa 101, and you delivered on that, and we're really grateful to you for that. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Kobus. Thank you for having me. Kobus, in the pre-show discussion that I had with Kanye, he mentioned something very interesting, and we didn't have a chance to get to it in our discussion, but I do want to bring it up. And he said one of the frustrations that he has is that when people talk about Chinese financing, they use the words Chinese financing as if it's a singular entity. But when we talk about U.S. financing, for example, we're very, very quick to differentiate between private creditor, Exim Bank, USAID. Yeah. We're v- and this is the same in Europe as well and even in Japan. And so all this lumping together of Chinese financing together implies that it's a monolithic entity and that there is a lot more political control than maybe there is. Typically, what I find in looking at Chinese politics, and it probably extends into finance as well, is that it's far more chaotic below the surface than people on the outside perceive it to be. There is this perception that the Communist Party, which is extraordinarily powerful, let's not ignore that, and does influence almost everything, but they don't necessarily have the power to drive every decision the way that I think it's perceived on the outside. Yes, I think that, that that's a big misconception, and and it's a it's a difficult line to walk because on the one hand, of course, the party plays a very big role in in, in shaping the general direction, you know, kind of of Chinese investment and lending, you know, through through initiatives like the the Belt and Road Initiative. But at the same time, all of these individual decisions also have to be made, um, and you know they, they don't necessarily pass through the party, or, or the party isn't necessarily you know party to to these decisions. Um, so it's a very complicated thing, and one has to kind of keep all of these different actors in mind at once. And it's interesting that so much of Chinese lending is at international rates. That was something I didn't realize that only thirty five percent or so of the loans are at uh, concessional rates, and that the rest are commercial which is a significant portion. And that's been one of the criticisms of Chinese loans, that oftentimes they are more expensive than uh, than other, say, World Bank or IMF loans, but those have conditions tied to them. Either those conditions are their lender of last resort, so you can't find financing elsewhere, or they sometimes come with structural adjustment type of initiatives or requirements that are very intrusive for some economies that they don't want to accede to. So it's not quite as simple as a lot of people are making it out to be. It's really important, I think, to 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 have nuance about this. And, and I think this is why we end up doing many, many episodes about this issue from different different angles, because there's so much to unpack. Um, you know, one of the things I would like to explore more in, in, in the future on a different episode is the issue of African yield. Um, and 
you know, kind of how how commercial lending from China differs from other commercial lending to Africa, and you know, just just kind of unpacking that particular issue. Um, you know, the the, the the problem I think at the moment, and, and this is I, I recently read a I recently wrote a, a, a kind of a fire breathing op ed at the moment, which is hopefully coming out at some stage. Um, is that there's so little time? Um, you know, all of these discussions. This is very, these are very complicated discussions in relation to to debt relief in Africa at the moment, but it's all happening while Africa is also slowly being pushed to a cliff of either default or or a kind of a massive health crisis because so much funds had to had to go into debt servicing. Um, so you know, kind of this is a great discussion to have in general because it's so interesting but at the moment it's also happening at this like insane rate where you know where be kind of some kind of solution has to be found before everything falls off a cliff and to be fair we don't actually know what is going on behind the scenes with the chinese so for all we know things are moving quite quickly and quite effectively for i mean we just we just don't know alonzo soto from bloomberg who we spoke with a couple weeks ago suggested that the angola deal is more or less wrapped up and ready to go so, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right that this is happening now. Africa is bleeding money uh, amid the, the worsening COVID-19 outbreak and the subsequent finance scan, uh, crisis that it's, it's, it's ensued. But at the same time, things do seem to be happening behind the scenes on the Chinese side. Who knows? But it brings up the question of transparency and accountability. And he raised a very interesting point that the borrower has a lot of agency here. So one of the episodes that I would like to do in a future uh, in, in the future, is why aren't African governments more transparent on their dealings with the Chinese? If they said, listen, we have to publish these contracts, we have to make sure that they go through legislative oversight review, and we have to have public comment, then that's the way it is. The borrower has the right to do that. Why don't they do that? So all of the burden on transparency is always put onto the Chinese side. I don't say this in any defense of the Chinese. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm actually saying it is a criticism of African governments who are oftentimes complaining about the lack of transparency, or their constituents are, and yet they have some agency in this matter. And I don't know if there's enough pressure on them to be able to say, we're going to publish these contracts, terms, interest, all of it, so that it's available for public uh, public review, like what we're seeing right now in Nigeria. Final comments to you, Copas, before we go. That's an excellent point, a very excellent point. And the thing is, <laughs> you know, that's one of the complications of dealing with African issues is that Africa is treated like dirt in the world, you know, kind of like Africa is in many cases treating, treated extremely unfairly. But that doesn't mean that African governments don't also suck. You know, that's that's so frequently the problem. Well, they have accountability to their own people on these things because it is future generations of, of taxpayer money. So that'll do it for this edition. Cobus has got to run very quickly to do another meeting. So we're going to wrap up this show very quickly before we go. We've started a new uh, program in order to make it easier for everybody to sign up for our newsletter. Try it out for three months, just $3. Uh, very, very simple. After that, it turns into a $15 a month subscription, $7 a month if you're a student or a teacher. Uh, we just, we're so excited that people are reading it and sharing it and discussing the ideas that we're bringing up in the newsletter. And we'd like to make it more accessible for you. $3 for three months. Go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. That'll do it for this edition of the show. I'm Eric Olander for Kobus van Staden. We'll, see, be, we'll be back again next week with another episode of the China in Africa podcast. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.